what are the mechanics or the psychology of a child's mind? So little has been known about it by psychologists and psychiatrists because their method of treatment lies mostly in response. Now, a little child uh, not being able to speak could never tell the psychologist uh, what his or her problems are because, to say again, they are dependent upon what you have to say. And according to what you have to say, they guide you by trying to probe deeper into your mind. But now with a child lacking that response, what can be done? And so little is understood about the mind. Where does the mind come from? How does the child have a mind? And how does it develop? where does perception begin and the various conceptions it is subjected to and how are they received. A child's mind starts at the moment of inception. As soon as the sperm penetrates the ovum, the mind is there already. Because the togetherness of the ovum and the sperm already contains the mind which is universal. For there is only one mind. There being only one mind, the child without having its brain cells developed in the envir stage uh, is not cognizant of the workings of the mind, although it is there. Now as the child develops in the envir and as brain cells start forming, then the child becomes slightly aware of the warmth of the womb. It becomes aware of the mother. When the fetus reaches about seven months, then a certain amount of perception takes place. So it is very important for pregnant women that when it comes to the seventh month of pregnancy that her mind is filled with good thoughts, holy thoughts, uplifting thoughts, or they create a subconscious impression on the fetus or the unborn child's mind. So now the child is born. It goes through certain traumatic experiences um, away from the comfort of the mother's womb to the outside world. It is a kind of a wrench. Many hospitals, they have changed the system now at many places, where many hospitals would take the child away immediately after birth and would put it in a crib or a baby's cot. And that is so wrong because the child is used to the mother's warmth and the mother's heartbeat. The mother's heartbeat gives the child a feeling of a particular rhythm and it is deprived of that rhythm. But now, just about a few years now, they have learned that after birth the child is given to the mother and the mother holds the child 
to her breast. Then the child gets a feeling of that same rhythm. So it does not feel as if she, it is wrenched away. Now, these are impressions the child gets. <coughs> Although the child cannot think yet. But these very impressions are the impressions that will guide the child's thinking as it grows up. Now, the most important years of a little child is up to about when it is three. Up to the age of three, it is still working on instinct and the impressions gained so far. And those three years are the most important years in a person's life. What you have been subjected to, all the impressions you have gathered in the first three years of your life can make you or break you when you grow up. Most mental illnesses do not come about suddenly. They've started there already, before the age of three. Quarrels in the home are felt by the child, because the child do have consciousness. The consciousness has begun because of the mind beginning at the time of conception. So, if there's a quarrel in the home between mother and father, then the child registers all those impressions within itself. Now, when we said that there is only one mind, then where does individuality come from? Individuality comes because of all those impressions. So, now, the child is ill, so how does the mother know? Should the mother only rely on the child's crying? How much hunger does a child feel? Because it has still not started thinking. It feels very little hunger. Never as much as a more grown-up child. Because the child has been fed in the womb through the umbilical cord, it still has that craving for something to go into it and not because it is severely hungry. It is a habit formed. We automatically uh, food is fed into it while still in the womb. Right. Now, because of that habit, when a child is born, often for a while it would uh, want to be fed. It will have it done die. Right. Yeah. Now, in the feeding of the child, and while the child is feeding from the mother's breast, they are gaining impressions of sexuality. They start with oral uh, sexuality. And then, of course, uh, they start having the impressions of becoming a little aware of anal sexuality. Therefore, therefore, we say, and all the medical fraternity agree, that sex is the strongest desire in a human being. It's the strongest driving force in a human being because it has started at an age when the child could not even think, but the impressions are made for its satisfaction. So, from the start, from conception, the child is fed with impressions. 
all of you die. Now, when a child is to be mowed dead, to the parents should give it such impressions, not on the thinking level, because a child is more intuitive because it has not started thinking yet. And of course, therefore, more impressionable. The child operates when it uh, moves its arms or legs or cries. It does not cry because of thinking processes. It cries because of the impressions. So, now, when a proper rapport has been established between a child and mother, the mother would automatically know the need of a child. The intuitive level is so wonderful and so powerful that the baby could be in the next room and when the baby wakes up, the mother wakes up. I mean, many of you that are mothers have experienced this. Now, what is this force? It is that intuitive force in the child and the child waking up would automatically wake up the mother because of that rapport that has been established. I'm talking of a good mother, you know, that would really look after the child. Right. So, what damages a child when it starts thinking? It's the thought processes. And schools and grown-ups and parents try to mold the child into certain ways of thinking. In other words, the parents block the natural growth of the child by you do this and you don't do that and you believe this and of course when it gets a bit older if it's a bit naughty you say the bogeyman is coming and take you away in a bag and yeah. now what are you doing you're implanting fear in the child so when it becomes an adult and becomes fearful who is to blame the fear but now the question that we are really want to inquire into is how to have total communication with an unthinking child. And that is possible. And that depends upon the rapport that the mother could have with the child or the father could have with the child. The child's mind uh, because of the impressions that are there, so the mind is alive. And if we can probe that, that aliveness in the child, then you can actually speak to the child. And the child will speak with you in a language silence. You've heard of certain people, like say St. Francis, that could speak to animals and others. And it is definitely done. Give me any child, and I will tell you exactly what is going through that child's mind by just looking at it, looking at its eye. And you can find out and know all those impressions that are in the child's mind. And that is what modern psychology lacks because they have not developed, psychologists have not developed that ability. And you cannot communicate with the child with your conscious mind because your conscious mind is prejudiced. It has biases. But you can communicate with the child at the final level of the mind, and that same level you use to communicate with animals. So, therefore, I said a little while ago, that the most important years of the child is until he reaches about three. 
It is true that by the age of one and two and that it starts a recognizing things. But that recognition is still not on the thinking level. It is on the impressionistic level, on the level of impressions. Fine. When it comes to colors, why is a little child, say one year old, you put a half a dozen colored objects there, little toys, it will be attracted to red. Why? To red first and not to yellow. Now that too is because of certain impressionistic things where the eye, uh, the retina could catch the red more powerfully than other colors. Now, as the child grows older, it is gathering all these impressions one by one by one. You can be angry and the child will feel anger more. You can bluff a grown-up, but you cannot bluff the baby. Yes. You can be angry as hell with someone and yet have a smile in your face. And the grown-up won't know. But not a child. The child feels immediately that a person is angry. And the same thing applies to every emotion. Love, for example. The child feels immediately. So, the child has a working mind in an impression. It is only after the age reaches about the age of three that the child gets spoiled. Spoiled in the sense that the wrong things are thrown at the little child all the time. And that is why the environment has such an effect on the child which carries on in his grown up life. We parents can do a lot for our children. A lot. Not when they grow up, because then they are in certain set ways already. But when they are from birth to the age of three. And they would be lasting. They would be lasting and would be carried over in the current appliance. So whatever impressions are implanted in that little susceptible mind there will make that grown up what he will be. Okay. So the children, the little children, even before they can think, pick up the Uh, how many people are there that don't like music? A very rare exception. Everyone loves music. Everyone does. As a matter of fact, Shakespeare has said in one of his poems that never trust a person who does not like a drink or music. <laughs> yes. So, because you like music, a little child enjoys a lullaby. Mm -hmm. Not because of things, but because of the impressions that are there. That is why all children like love. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing out these various points to show you how important it is in those first three years for parents to be very, very careful. Even, even you might quarrel a block away and that child is going to feel it. Like for example, a little dog, the master is still a few blocks away and, and it runs to the front door, thinking the master is coming home. In the same way, in the same way, the child functions. 
in animals we call it at an instinctive level in humans we call it an intuitive level now what happens to the mind is this that the left hemisphere which the grown up uses so much in uh, analyzing and things like that in thinking the child does not yet but the child uses the right hemisphere of the brain which is through which uh, intuition is brought about so if we have grown up children that are not behaving well we blame ourselves first now when the child starts using the left hemisphere the thinking level the analytical level that is where all the troubles begin because when it starts thinking a bit it finds so many contradictions in its environment and it will it wants to compare it with the impressions that were gained now if wrong impressions were gained during the first three years then the child if given a choice will choose a something which would be compatible with the impression gained good impressions are gained and when it comes to a choice the child will choose that which is compatible the good thing which is compatible because of the good impression and it's again and again that is so important that you see he says yes he and us yeah. <laughs> so it is so important in those in those stages the parents have to be very careful an unhappy family can never produce a happy child when it grows up now sanskaras plays a big part in it but sanskaras can be redirected because sanskaras too is an energy and it can be redirected remolded so that it could become more conducive to live a happier life you know there was a pickpocket and he met a girl who was also a pickpocket and uh, they thought to themselves that if we should get married and have a child the child will become a super pickpocket <laughs> so they did get married and the child was born but the child would just not open its fist and they were quite worried about it because how is he going to carry on with his pickpocketing profession if he doesn't open its fist right so they went to a doctor and the doctor said that i can do nothing about this let me refer you over to a good psychologist so they went to the psychologist and the parents explained what they were that they are big pockets and you know the child's life would be ruined if it can't open its fist you know to become that super big pocket so the psychologist was a clever guy and uh, he looked at the child heard his story and then he took out his gold watch and waved it in front of the child eyes the way it is in front of the child's eyes and then slowly the child started opening its fist and do you know what was found in the child's hand <laughs> the midwife's wedding ring <laughs> So we the reason 
reason why I thought this question was of great interest is because uh, many people come to me for counseling about their children. So, now, when the child starts thinking, then its environment throws so many wrong thoughts to the child. Starts off at home with parents not behaving the way they should and that the child starts thinking about that. And then when the child reaches school age and then a lot of wrong things are thrown into the child's mind, creating anger, creating fear, creating greed all kinds of things. In school, uh, a child pinches uh, um, a pencil from another child that comes home and the parents won't say anything about it. Oh, well, save me from buying the pencil, saving tuppence. Things are wrong. So naturally, when the child grows up, it would have that larceny and thievery in its blood. A uh, parent came to me with a uh, boy of about 11, 19, 11 or 12. Now, in South Africa, in the schools there, you have a period called the free period. And in the free period, the teacher discusses anything they like uh, to the children. This little teacher, I don't think she was more than 19 or 20, a real idiot. Yeah. There are many teachers in the world today that would be better off as street sweepers rather than teachers. Yeah. So this teacher, uh, in one of the three periods, was telling the children that if you travel in an aeroplane and the window breaks, She's talking about the pressurization in a plane. When the window breaks, you can get sucked out. Yeah. And then, after you get sucked out, you'll die and all these things. And all the seats will get sucked out and you know, things like that. This poor child, hearing that from the teachers, developed such fear of wind that if it was a windy day, the child wouldn't want to go out, thinking that its neck would be twisted. Oh. They start getting nightmares, the remembering what the teacher said. So the mother, the parent, I think it was the mother, yeah, it was the mother, came to see me brought the child and talked to the child, explaining these things. And it is so easy to communicate with children, if you know. If you have the love, that's a primary quality. It could be any child, but if you have the love, you can really probe. I mean, at the age of 11, 12, you can really get into the child. Fine, and these are the things I found out. So I said, well, tomorrow morning, uh, what school are you at? I took the address, and I went to the school, and I said, I told the mother, meet me there at the school, such and such a time. I went to see the principal, and I said, uh, could you call Miss so-and-so, whatever the name was, to the office? So the principal did. So I started talking to the teacher. I said, when you talk about all these various things in your free period, and I gave her some instances, I said, do you know how you're damaging the children? Hmm? I'm planting fear into them of that which is not real. How many times has an aeroplane window broken and how many people have been sucked out? I've never heard of one. <laughs> yeah. This teacher's brain is a should have been sucked out. <laughs> <laughs> so then she realized, thank God, of her mistake, and she said, Sir, I, shall, I didn't realize that I didn't know this. And of course, I shall be very careful. Now, 
What I'm trying to point out and illustrate to you is that a child, even when it has started thinking, is subjected to all these things in our sick society. Now, how to protect the child from being influenced by the environment is what you plant into the child in the first The more love you show the child in those three, three years, the more loving it will become. And the more you treat the child with kindness and care, the more loving and caring it will become. And then all that which society throws against it, the child will not like us. So, child delinquency, we hear so much of it today. They just never became delinquent because they wanted to. It started off in those first three years by uncaring parents. And the basic need of everyone is love. And then when the child grows up, he tries to find that love in some way or the other. The child learns to steal or to smoke, what we call that, hashes, hashes, hmm? yeah, all that, because of the, of the peer group, it learns from the peer group. And why does it want to learn from the peer group? Because it wants love from that circle of friends. That's the basis of it. They want to belong. And the basis of belonging is to find out. So it all starts in the first years. Now, if psychologists, when looking at the sick child, could communicate with the child on that final level, not the conscious mind, then the psychologist would be in a better position to understand what's wrong with the child. So parents play a great part in molding it so that the child will not be influenced by society and the doings in the world as they grow up. Now, how can we become better parents? By becoming better meditators and doing it regularly. For spiritual practices produces that love in you, produces that kindness in you. I've seen little babies of meditating parents and you could recognize those babies a mile away. You could recognize a mile away that, ah, uh, this child comes from meditating parents. That is, I find, about the only solution to make our children, the future generation, the future leaders of the world, into better people by starting with ourselves.